Good evening. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. Grateful for your presence and delighted that you have decided to tune in to listen to our service. We do have uh, a great lineup today to work with us. Linda Collins is on the organ and Sarah Vogler uh, is on the piano. Ariana will be helping us and Linda Kirchie will be on bells and Reverend Jason Elmore will be our preacher for the day. And of course, Tyler is behind the scenes making sure that all of this goes well. So we are so grateful for you being with us here on Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday is also known as Holy Thursday, the Thursday of Passion Week, one day before Good Friday. Monday, Thursday is the name given on the day in which Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples, known as the Last Supper. But there are two important events that I want us to focus on as we think of Monday, Thursday. The first is that Jesus celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples and thereby instituted the Lord's Supper, better known to us as communion. Second, Jesus washed the disciples' feet in humility and he did it so that they would in turn do it for others. And the word Monday is derived from the Latin word for command. That Thursday when Jesus met with his disciples, he commanded them at the Lord's Supper to love one another and to serve one another. So I pray that this will be your thoughts today on Monday, Thursday, that you would think about ways in which you can serve the Lord in humility. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we are so grateful for what you did to us on that Monday, Thursday, and the lessons that you taught and your willingness to serve and to die even on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray that your spirit might fall on each person that is live streaming, that you might touch their hearts and make their hearts tender, tender for the word that shall come, tender for the songs and the music that will come. Open our hearts that we might truly have an encounter with you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our first hymn will be hymn two, 292, What Wondrous Love Is This?
I'm so grateful that Linda Kirchie came with, uh, to practice with me. We've been working on the Old Rugged Cross, which I know is a favorite for many of you, and just a beautiful reminder of how much Jesus loves us, that he would go to the cross. And I wish you were all in person, that we could be here in person together. Uh, it's so, um, it's hard to look out and not see all of your faces, but I know that you're watching and we're praying for you and believing that we'll be reunited soon. So we pray that you enjoy uh, this duet. Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, it is with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man. When those who were around him saw what was coming, they, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? And then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus says, no more of this. 
and he touched his ear and he healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you didn't lay hands on me. But this is your hour in the power of darkness. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, the hearing of God's holy word. May it sink deep down and bring forth much fruit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. Let us pray. Most gracious and almighty God, may the words of my mouth today be anointed by you. Allow your spirit to speak through me this evening and let everything that I say be glorifying to you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Who is God? What is God like? And where is God when we need him? These are probably some of the, the most asked questions from, from persons of faith and, and maybe even better yet, persons that are out there looking for faith. Day in and day out, our life can be extremely difficult. And these difficulties can cause even the strongest of disciples of Jesus to have moments of, of doubt and uncertainty and discouragement. In my congregation at Asbury Memorial over this uh, Lenten season, we've been having a sermon series titled Jesus on Trial. And we've been walking on our way to the empty tomb of Jesus and in hopes that we're going to recommit ourselves to be his disciples. We've been looking at, at Old and New Testament persons who have, have faced difficult experiences or situations or, or decisions similar to, to what we face even today. And the biggest question for us as disciples today and then is, can God be trusted when things don't seem to make sense? So with that in mind, this this Lenten season, as Jesus is on trial, these persons are our character witnesses. People that have gone before us and have found that God's faithfulness was their source of strength. Right in the midst of their greatest struggle. And we're going to use their stories as a basis to recommit ourselves as a disciple of Jesus in our world today. And as I start out this evening, I want to, want to take a few moments to consider the night that Pastor Derek had talked about of the Last Supper. Jesus celebrating this, this final Passover meal with his disciples during his earthly ministry, and he, and he formally institutes this new covenant. On that same night, Jesus would later be betrayed by one disciple and denied by another. So this evening, Jesus gathers his closest followers to eat this Passover meal. This annual observance and celebration reminded the, the Jews of Jesus' day and many Jewish people who are living in our world today of how God had miraculously delivered their people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And just as God had delivered Israel from Egyptian oppression, that first Passover night, many ancient scholars of the Old Testament thought that God's Messiah would one day deliver his people from oppression during a celebration of Passover. So even as the, the Jewish people ate the Passover meal and they remembered their people's history, they also ate it with anticipation about their future, hoping that their Christ, their Messiah, would come. Now the Passover meal was, a, was assembled using a very specific set of instructions. Each item at the table represented some memory of the Israelites' bondage and suffering and slavery or their victorious exodus from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. And during that normal Passover meal, the, the head of the family 
or someone recognized as the leader of a group would fill the role of teacher and explain the different items represented there. And during this final Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus once again filled the role as teacher. And can you imagine this immeasurable insight that he passed on to his disciples that night? And in addition to this, explaining the Passover symbolism, Jesus shared this new observance with his disciples that night. This new observance shared once again focused on the deliverance of God's people, but this time the deliverance was from e- not from Egypt or Rome, it was from the true enemy, and that's sin. The bondage of sin and death. So in our story tonight, the Pastor Derek read for us, I want us to to take a moment to focus on something that, that maybe we generally don't focus on at times. This is the, the story of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. A story that, that we may not know a whole lot about. We, we get caught up in the midst of Jesus praying in the garden and, and coming to his disciples while they are sleeping. And then the arrest of Jesus. I want to share a story about a, a small Georgia town. And in this small town in Georgia, there's a, a, this huge pile of rocks that stack neatly to a, to a height of almost about eight feet tall. And it's located at the edge of the town limits, and everyone in that town knows that this, this uh, stack of rocks is supposed to, to mean something. It was meant to be some type of, of monument, but no one is exactly sure to whom or what this monument is. And it's been there for more than 150 years, making a silent statement that has really been lost over time. Now, I think many people know of, of, the, uh, of another rock formation called Stonehenge in England, but also not sure exactly what it means. The great pyramids of Egypt and the many Indian mounds of North and South America are ancient of evidence of these societies and their mysteries. And the Holy Scripture is the same for us. It has mysteries a whole lot like those monuments. And one of those mysteries is in our text today. Because we've read this story so many times of Jesus' last night with his disciples and the soldiers coming to arrest him, but sometimes we seem to just pass on by this this miracle that Jesus performs to, to this chief priest servant, Malchus. And what happened to him that night as he led this group out to arrest Jesus? Right in the midst of of when all of this was going on, there was probably several people fighting and and scuffling and and yelling around. And Jesus comes and he performs another unbelievable miracle. And I think this story today of the healing of of Malchus' ear, I think gives us a a final look into Jesus' character in demeanor during a very stressful and and chaotic situation that was going on. And tonight I want us to take a look at at three things that we can learn from this miracle. The first one is, Jesus never left a situation undone. You see, throughout the life and ministry of Jesus, he was always thorough and complete in his dealings. When John the Baptist was questioning The baptism of Jesus. Jesus tells him, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus reminded his disciples in the Gospel of John, he says, my food is to do the will of God that sent me and to finish God's work. There's a great story of a, of a gentleman, and maybe you know someone like this, who is just a, a great mechanic and can pretty much do anything with a, with a car engine or with the body of a vehicle. If there's a problem, then you take it to this man. We had a, a gentleman like that in the, the fire department. It didn't matter what it was. All he had to do was drive it around briefly or just listen to it a little bit, and he knew exactly how to fix it. It wasn't his profession, but it was a passion and hobby. Well, this mechanic was the same way, and he enjoyed doing it so much what he decided to do was to go out and and look for some fixer-uppers, some some vehicles that needed a little TLC. 
And he would go out and buy them, but the problem was is that he would never finish all of the repairs. He'd almost get one fixed. And then he would see another bargain-priced vehicle that he just had to purchase to fix that one up. And he eventually accumulated so many of these vehicles on his property that the, that the local government zoned his property as a junkyard. And he didn't start out to accumulate this junkyard full of cars, but he had this inability to, to finish the project and ended up becoming a laughingstock in his neighborhood. And a question that I heard, uh, thought to myself after I read that story was, how many of us in our lives today as Christians live like that man? We tell ourselves, you know, I'm going to read the Bible through this year all the way to the end, but we quit after a few weeks. Or we tell ourselves we're going to devote 15 minutes a day to prayer, but then we get so busy that we forget to do it. Or we take on a, a new ministry in our church only to give up when something gets tough in the situation. You see, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to realize that we have to finish what we start. When Jesus bowed his head on the cross a couple of days later, his last words were, it is finished. He left this legacy of finishing what he started. And if you look specifically in our story today, Jesus could have allowed, to be, uh, allowed them to take him by the mob without healing Malchus's ear. But he didn't. He paused. That wasn't the way of Jesus. He just saw the pain in this man. He saw the hurt, the knee, and he reached down and healed Malchus. The first thing is, Jesus never left things undone. Number two, Jesus was the calm in the midst of chaos. Amen? You see, I don't know how many of you know this about me. I know the folks in Asbury Memorial know, but I am terrified of snakes. Absolutely terrified. Even so, my wife and I were doing some yard work this past week, and we were moving some, some rocks in our backyard, and a, a little snake, probably, it wasn't much bigger than a worm, she found. Well, believe me, I'm not the one that took care of it. I ran the other way. My wife had to take care of it. But I want to share this story with you about snakes. And this is actually some instructions that are given to members of the Peace Corps serving in Brazil on how to react to hungry pythons. Now, I want, you, I want to read it to you. It says, remember, do not run away. The python can move faster. The thing to do is to lie flat on the ground, on your back, with your feet together, arms at your side, head down. The python will then try to push its head under you experimenting at every possible point. And then underlined in bold, it says, keep calm. Yeah, right, amen? You see, it says then, you must let him swallow your foot. It's quite painless and it will take a long time. If you lose your head and struggle, he will quickly whip his coils around you. If you keep calm and still, he will go on swallowing. Wait patiently until he is swallowed up to about your knee. Then carefully take out your knife and insert it into the distended side of the mouth and with a quick rip, slit up. Can you imagine laying there for that amount of time in the midst of this, this crisis of this snake to be patient and calm? It wouldn't happen for me. It would already have just eaten me entirely and squeezed every life out of me that it has. But if you look in our story today, as Jesus is being arrested, the scene was chaotic, especially after Peter cuts the ear of servant Malchus right off. There was probably some scuffling, as I said earlier, between the soldiers and the disciples, but Jesus immediately steps up and Jesus calms the situation. And when you scratch the surface of it, you discover that there's a whole lot of symbolism in our story today. But when you're in the midst of a situation like our world is dealing with today, when life just becomes another word for chaos, there's little that's symbolic about it. It's just pain, right? You see, our text today doesn't promise that Jesus is going to overcome your pain as quickly as he healed the ear of Malchus, but this is what Jesus will do. Jesus will come to you in the midst of your personal chaos. And he's going to offer you his divine healing 
and presence. And at the very least, you will know that you're not alone in your situation. Unfortunately, we're not able to take Holy Communion tonight as we usually do during this this annual service, but I want you to, to focus just for a minute, and I want you to remember something next time that you take the bread and cup. There's so many times that that we come to the table and we come with with trembling hands and it has nothing to do with us being nervous or afraid, but everything to do with the the chaos that we're experiencing in our life. And I want you to to believe and trust that in that bread and cup that you're going to find the presence of Jesus who can calm your fears and bring you peace. You see, when Jesus encounters Malchus, they're in the midst of this chaos all around them. Jesus doesn't just talk a good game. He delivers in this game as well. Jesus knows what to do. Jesus brings calm and peace to what is chaos. And even in the midst of this chaos, when, especially when your life is chaotic, Jesus knows what to do. Jesus knows how to handle a virus. Jesus knows how to handle your anxiety. Jesus knows how to handle your depression and your addiction or your marriage or your career or bills. You can add any other stress that you're dealing with today and know that Jesus is your calm in the midst of life's chaos. Amen? Amen. And then number three and final. Jesus gave everyone that night especially Malchus, another glimpse of his glory. You see, people today in our world, many of them have heard of the name of Jesus Christ all their lives. Even people who were who were non-believers, even people who were atheists have heard the name Jesus Christ. For those that have grown up in church, you have heard countless sermons and and messages about Jesus. There are movies about Jesus that are shown over and over and over again. But yet so few really know Jesus. Jesus' disciples followed him every step of the way for more than three years. And he still had to say to them, Have I been with you all this time and you still do not know me? You see, Jesus was a man, yet he was... God. And as as this great divine king, Jesus loves us with an individual singular love. And the disciples like us today had, had trouble understanding all that Jesus was and all that Jesus is. And as the head servant of the high priest Caiaphas, Malchus knew the claims about Jesus. He knew what the religious leaders thought of Jesus. They were saying that Jesus was a charlatan that he was a fake, that he was the false Messiah, that he was a heretic. And Malchus, as a servant, was given a job to do. That job was to to take an army of men out into the night and to bring in Jesus to Caiaphas for trial. It was just a job for him. You see, the Bible doesn't record what Malchus thought of this, this so personal of a miracle. All it says is that there was a sword and that He probably ducked and then felt a sharp pain in the side of his head. Probably felt blood drip down onto his his uniform and probably had a ringing in his ear. But this Malchus, who had felt the healing hand of Jesus touch him, what did he do? He continued with his assignment. He brought Jesus bound and and beaten and battered to to the home of his master, Caiaphas. And I wonder, did he ever recount the events of that night in his head? Did he ever think about all that had happened when Jesus reached down and touched the side of his face? In John's gospel of Jesus' prayer in the garden, Jesus expresses that his greatest desire was that his people might be with him to behold his glory. And in verse 24 of that it says, Father, I want those you have given to me to be where I am, and to see my glory, the glory which you have given because you love me before the creation of the world. There's a theologian by the name of John Owen. As he reflected on that that verse, he says these words. One of the greatest privileges that believers have, both in this world and for eternity, is to behold the glory of Jesus. Indeed, it is by beholding the glory of Jesus that believers are first gradually transformed into the image of God and then brought into the eternal enjoyment of it because they shall be forever like Him. For they shall see Jesus 
as he is. And then he goes on to, to make a, a, a kind of a startling but an obvious point. He says, no human shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight in heaven who does not in some measure behold it by faith in this world. You see, the question is, is, is when we see God's glory, do we recognize it? Do, are, are we able to, to see God's glory in our world today in the midst of the crisis that we're dealing with? And I'm sure that at some point Malchus pondered that event. Later that evening, maybe, or the next day, and he truly saw and he truly understood who Jesus truly was. You see, Jesus had given him a glimpse of his glory and his deity. Jesus had personally shown Malchus who he was. He showed him that he wasn't a charlatan, that he wasn't a fake, a false prophet that Caiaphas had talked about and had worked so hard against. Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. But in his death, Malchus had a hand in it. You see, Malchus, like the others of, of that day, rejected Jesus, even in the face of the miracles and the works that Jesus did. And unfortunately, all too often, we do as well. We reject Jesus, and we send Jesus to the cross over and over and over again for our sins. But luckily, luckily for you and for me, Jesus was willing to accept the cup of suffering and die for each and every one of us and our sins. You see, every time that, that we sin, can't you just hear the hammer hitting the nail into the cross over and over again? again. You see, the good news for us is that the glory of Jesus Christ didn't stop with the healing of Malchus on that Thursday. Jesus' glory continued a few days later when he got up and he walked out of the grave alive and well. His glory continues today in the midst of our chaos. His glory continues as we walk, as he walks with us through every situation. His glory continues as He wakes us up every single morning. And it continues because He was arrested. He was beaten and He was tortured. He was stretched out wide on the cross while being ridiculed and made fun of. Because Jesus was laid in a borrowed tomb that He only used for three days. And on that first Easter morning rose from the dead showing all that, that God's unconditional love will always be greater than death. Amen? You see, Malchus experienced that love that night that Jesus was arrested. And I want to close with one thing that he probably thought about later. And I sure hope he did. You see, when you, when I experience the glory of Jesus, you will be changed. Your anger turns to love. Your, your grudge turns to forgiveness. Your judgment turns to grace. Your chaos turns to peace. Don't ever let the glory of Jesus pass you by without fully experiencing the love of God. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we are thankful. We are thankful people that we come today to, to celebrate and worship you, Lord. Lord, we... Uh, we know that we have lots going on in the world, but we know that you're not going to let things stay undone. That you're going to continue to show us your glory and that you are going to make calm out of the chaos that we're experiencing. So Lord, on this night, we, we give you all the honor and glory and we pray for all of those that are watching and those who can't be with us tonight. And we pray all of this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. God praise and thanks for a wonderful message. I was sitting there and I did not want it to stop. And I wanted it to keep on going and I pray the same for, for all of you. Um, our next song can be found on page 286, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded.
For our benediction today, I'm going to use a, a section from Psalm 145. Let us pray. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over all creation. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your faithful ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And we pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.